first experience for me. So normally I would stand up and in front of a group of people and present, and and uh, here I am uh, doing something similar over over the interweb. It's uh, it's a first for me. So bear with me if something goes sideways. So inside parking UBC meters, gate list, LPR, and, and all that jazz. Um, in terms of in terms of agenda, um, just some quick intros, uh, some background on the problems that we faced, uh, the, the solutions that we've deployed, the results we've seen, what are we doing next, what do I think is coming up next, and then your questions. So fairly compact. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you've got anything in particular that you want to ask, start throwing them in, uh, and, and I'll get to them. The University of British Columbia, so where are we? Well, we're on the western outskirts of the city of Vancouver on a peninsula. This is a photograph of it. It's a very large campus of about 1,000 acres, just slightly under. Um, fairly compact core, lots of undeveloped urban space. And in the photograph, you can see the city of Vancouver uh, off to the left at about 10 o'clock. Uh, and logs and wood and stuff like that uh, floating in the Pacific Ocean to the right. In terms of the campus itself, uh, we're, we're quite large. We've got a student base, depending on who you ask, of anything from 55 to 65,000 um, undergraduates and graduates, about 15,000 staff, and an additional 10,000 people living on campus. So we're quite large. Um, and over, over the years, that's, that's changed quite a lot, as you'll see in a second. Specifically with regards to the parking, um, I suspect that for a lot of people on the call, your parking not too long ago looked very similar to this, and this is certainly our experience, where we have very ex where we had very expansive uh, parking lots, um, surface, thousands and thousands of, of, of vehicles, tons of space. But this is very valuable land that we're choosing to park cars on. So we used to look a lot like this. And then we started to do an awful lot of this, which is essentially digging up the roads, putting in new buildings, and filling in the core of campus to make room for stuff like this. This is a research facility, the Center of Brain Health, that opened about a year and a half ago. And for the eagle-eyed uh, amongst you, on the, on the glass, etched into the glass, uh, you'll see not an octopus. That's uh, neurons and ganglions and nerves and stuff like that. So our campus, like a lot of campuses, a lot of municipalities and cities, has been filling in and getting busier uh, much more in, in, in the core itself, which has led to increased demands around proximate parking in the, in the center of the, of the campus. Again, the eagle-eyed amongst you will see above that silver minivan to the right a, a meter, uh, and above that meter is a little, a little uh, hood, a, a rain hood that we developed and implemented ourselves here at UBC. Well, that's a little bit about uh, the university. Uh, this is me. This is me when I was eight. The reason that, that I use an older photograph as opposed to a current one is twofold. One is I don't think I've changed materially, and if, anybody, if any of you have ever met me, um, I think I look fairly similar, somewhat. I've, I've filled out over time as, as uh, adult beverages have taken their toll on me. Um, but by and large, uh, my philosophy is I don't take myself too seriously, but I take the work that I do very seriously indeed, and certainly the people that I meet and the lives that I change for the good or, or for the worse. So that's the introduction. In terms of the problems we faced, I suspect that all, if not most, of our challenges um, are, are very similar to yours, actually. So capacity constraints. So campus over the years has been reduced from 14,000 spaces down to a little over 7,800. The university, as I said, has been filling in with new research facilities. But the real crux of the problem has been caused by adding additional student housing. So students want to live on campus and have that university experience. But there's been no parking added. That's one piece, capacity. The second is, is that uh, there's been a lot of pressure around access versus convenience. 
So lots of groups have been very vocal, so uh, handicapped and mobile customers, obviously. Parents who are concerned about proximate access, so um, anybody who's involved with universities in North America is very well versed around student safety um, and the risk of uh, unfortunate sexual or other uh, personal attacks. Right the way through to how do we get people who are going to uh, dropping their kids off at summer camps in the, 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 the municipal city environment, that would be schools, how do we get pick up and drop off facilities, so access over convenience. There's a lack of uh, system integration. I joined UBC about three years ago, and I'm not from the parking industry. My background is actually, um, I came from healthcare and before that, uh, large multi-site retailing. But it was clear to me there was a lack of system integration. So there was lots of disintegrated, disaggregated systems and equipment. So we had different meter types. Uh, some of it was somewhat connected, some of it was not. Um, different gates, different gate equipment. So it wasn't particularly simple for our customers to understand. And in terms of operational productivity, it was very much suboptimal. Like everybody on the call, um, the, the, we had increased demand. So everybody wants more money at the end of the day. So increase your revenue and decrease your cost. That's very simple to, to say. Not quite that easy to, to pull off. And I'll talk more about that in a second. There's also a need, I think, as uh, as within any urban area or any campus setting uh, to mitigate capital expenditure. So long term, that means parkades or parking garages, whichever term you prefer to use. But they're pretty expensive. Uh, for us, the short term issue was, was our um, parks equipment. So our gates, our access equipment and transponders was pretty old, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, there's increased the needs around the customer. So gates, by and large, at some point cause delays. And customers told us in no uncertain terms that they were fed up about delays. And essentially, they were saying, let me out. And then the last piece, uh, any, any large organization is more and more in, uh, concerned about sustainability. So greenhouse gas uh, reductions. Um, we're, we're increasingly uh, hard to achieve. Most of the low-hanging fruit has, has been picked, so how could we, parking, play, play a role in that? I don't think there's anything in there that's, that's particularly unusual to the parking industry. We resolved the capacity uh, uh, issue by um, essentially reducing demand. So this is, this is the volume of, of, of um, individuals, how they get to campus. So in fall of 97, most people were driving here either in a single occupancy vehicle or in a high occupancy vehicle. Only 18% were taking transit. In and around, I think it was the year 2008, uh, the universities and the local transit operator um, brought in this universal student pass. And it, it essentially um, put an awful lot of student volume from vehicles onto transit. So in the fall of 2014, Transit now accounts for 55% of, of, of people's options to get to campus, or how they get to campus. Single occupancy vehicle is now 33, so a 10% market share drop. High occupancy vehicles have taken the biggest hit, so people are not carpooling, they're not car sharing. They're either, they've taken the transit, or for a lot of people, they're still riding, uh, getting to work in a single occupancy vehicle. The other m measures have not changed. What that has meant is that we have, we have essentially mitigated that long-term need to go and construct a parking garage. That's pretty important. Profitability. So the, the UPASS saw that, that drop in, in demand, but it meant that there were fewer people driving the campus. So that put a strain on annual revenue. Yet the university wanted our contribution, our, how much we paid them back as a dividend each year to be to main, maintained which meant that our cash flow was adversely impacted. So our books looked fairly unpleasant uh, in, in many ways. So we're making good money, but we're just not keeping up with cash flow. Long-term debt was building up. Our ability to raise rates was limited because we were already charging $75 a month plus the tax. And then in 2010, the local transit authority uh, applied a 20% parking levy, which meant that it went up to $100 a month. $100 a month is a very emotional, uh, point uh, over which people become very reluctant to, to pay for parking. This was probably the biggest driver for us in terms of um, 
really pushing us to think differently about our operation. So we operate six parking uh, parkades, parking garages. We've got 28 lanes, and all the equipment was really old federal stuff. Now we estimated, and these may be different numbers to what you ex you would expect to see. It depends on your operation where you are. Um, but essentially, to replace those 28 lanes, best estimates put us in and around the three million dollars. By the time we add on the equipment, the UBC IT, the UBC facilities charges, because some of this work has to be done uh, by our unionized employees. So let's call it $3 million. The PUC system that I refer to, this is essentially the uh, RFID um, transponder that sat on your windshield. It looked like a hockey puck, that's why I call it a puck. But it was a, a really old Sirit system. The best estimate when I asked how long, how old this, this system was, was it's super old, Brian, so it must have been pretty ancient. And we'd actually run out of these pucks. We had no more. We physically didn't have any. So to replace that system as well as all the antennas, uh, at the, in, in addition to the parks equipment, was another half a million to a million dollars. So it put us in, in, a, in a position where we knew we were going to have a capital cost of anything at the very low end, three million, more than likely in the three and a half to four million uh, dollars to replace all this equipment and get it installed and up and running. For me, that was a challenge, uh, not so much on the capital, but it's because we weren't solving a fundamental problem that our customers are still waiting at gates. Really made me scratch my head. So you could say that our access and control was suboptimal, and these ladies are actually trying to, well, well they did raise the gate. This is an old screenshot. Um, you can see some of the equipment. It's not the best photograph by any means, but uh, I suspect that for many, that's, that's a similar situation. Your access isn't great and neither is your control. Back to the uh, increased demands. Uh, so the customer service, so all gates, they break down, there's delays, and our loops were telling us that on average weights into and then another wait as you leave was in the 20 to 30 second range. During events, it could be horrific. I remember uh, an, an event which was, uh, it was, it was uh, targeted to to mums and small toddlers, I can't remember the name of the event. Um, the gates failed at this particular parkade and all these mums with their toddlers in the back couldn't get out. So there's a long conga line of cars jammed full of kids who were tired and hungry and probably needed diaper changing and all that kind of stuff. And it was not good. It, the feedback was as, as, as uh, horrific as you can imagine. And that led to an overall uh, wider conversation was, was about value for money. So here we were, we were providing not great service, but we're charging pretty good money for it. It, it was an argument that we weren't winning. And then the last one, uh, again, to touch on is the sustainability piece. So transportation accounts for most of the greenhouse gases, but the university had not really done a lot about, um, and not really done a lot about parking. So instead of focusing on the basics, the, 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 the solution was, well, you know, when we construct the building, we'll make it LEED compliant. And in terms of parking, let's put EV charging stations everywhere. That's great. But I don't know many people on this call who, as an example, are driving Teslas. I'm not. So EV charging stations are, are good, but they're not the answer. OK, so solutions that we deployed. So that, the first place that I started was to develop the vision. So I generally speak and approach problems like this with, with trying to develop something with, with the end in mind. And there's three factors for me. Garages, parkades will become smart multi-dimensional hubs. Proximity to destinations will be reduced and in high demand. And it's, the conversation is going to be about access and not proximity. So we developed an 86-page uh, white paper uh, called Parkade to the Future. And this is just a quick opening statement from it, which I think is applicable here. So in the future, parking structures at UBC could be far more than vessels for storage of vehicles. Parkades, garages, could intentionally evolve into intensified and tangent hubs that act to promote positive experiences for students, faculty, and staff, and visitors. The facilities will actively seek to engage and enhance users' social lives while promoting environmental responsibility, economic stability uh, in the process. So really, what we're talking about here is we, need to, we needed to revisit how we operate the garages with a view to creating smart parking to resolve these service issues. 
to improve sustainability and to, to rectify the integration challenges, because otherwise we just weren't going to be profitable in the long term. So what do we do? <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first piece is that we, first phase, we looked at essentially focusing on the basics. So we went to a single meter type. So we were already using uh, digital loop meters in some locations, not all. Moving to a single meter type really gave us uh, and gave the customers consistent experience and from an operator's perspective, uh, easy to operate and maintain. So this is, this is very much the Southwest Airlines model. They only use 737s is my understanding. So from a customer's perspective, you always know where you're sitting because 15B is 15B in all the planes. And from an operator's perspective, it's just easy to maintain. We all, so we decided single meters, um, so we went down that road. We implemented pay by plate. Pay by plate, again, improves the customer experience because you don't have to return to the car to display the ticket. That's by far and away the biggest bugbear that, that I heard uh, around the, the systems and the processes that we had deployed. From an operator's perspective, it improves revenue because you can't have ticket passing and the associated revenue bleed. And for the permit holder, account creation uh, makes sense for the operator because we get information about the customer and data is critical. It also means that we can now enforce by mobile LPR. This, this transformed the staff productivity. Um, it made a, a huge difference in terms of the engagement of the teams as well because whilst Vancouver is a moderate climate, it rains a lot, very much like Seattle. Uh, and for, for those folks on the line who are in cold climates, I'm sure you know and appreciate how painful it is to have uh, your enforcement team walking around in, the, in the, the deepest, darkest days of winter, as opposed to uh, driving in, in the comfort and warmth of a vehicle. So that's a lot of talking and a lot of text. So, so here's, a, here's a couple of photographs. So this shows our loop two meter, uh, and, in, and then in the background is our one of our three enforcement uh, vehicles. Uh, they, they're all Prius Cs, um, and you can see the cameras uh, on the roof. The other piece that I would say, if you're going to go down the road of uh, pay by plate, um, is to make sure that the signage is really clear and really simple. So we went and studied the market, and we came up with this one, two, three uh, kind of process and made sure that the signage across campus, whether it's in a surface lot uh, like this, so this is our stadium, uh, or street, um, uh, street parking, the, the signage is consistent and we try to use less text, more icons because we have a substantial population where English is their second language. That was the first thing we did. The second piece then is that we went and integrated all the systems. And this was somewhat in uh, conjunction with the first. So we were already using uh, T2 Flex. So we centralized that, uh, all our, plat all, all our uh, systems around T2. So we're very big on uh, all our permits now are, are online uh, only. So virtual permits, everything is based around the license plate of the vehicle. So no more of those hockey pucks that I mentioned sitting on the dash. I actually walked through one of the parkades yesterday trying to find a photograph uh, to put in this presentation about one, for, of, of one of these old uh, hockey pucks. And I went through five levels of the parkade and I couldn't see a single puck on the windshield. Uh, digital meters, uh, we've already talked below, so the Loop 2s, so they're, they're, they're very good. We found them very solid. Um, card, coin, and codes. So if you're, if you're looking to give departments, VIPs access, you can issue codes. We use the auto view, as you just saw, from Genetech. When I initially got here, we were only using that system for scoff law. Well, that didn't make any sense. So now we use it for scoff law, making sure that people are paid at the meter, making sure they paid at the phone or that they've got a permit. Pay by phone is, is, uh, is part of this integration, as is the handheld units so or the ticket writers. So we currently use uh, T2's enforcement um, platform um, with uh, Note 3's. In my world, this is what system integration looks like because I don't understand it very well, but I know the principles behind it. And, and this, is, this is as simple as I'd like to keep it for me, but I'll know 
But in the real world, system integration actually looks more like this. It's getting more and more complicated, more and more noisy. The internet of everything is already here, in my opinion. So the system integration, <coughs> excuse me, the system integration is absolutely critical, and you can't do that unless you've got some degree of sophistication in the equipment and the processes uh, that, that you employ. So if you're using old coin meters, they're essentially dumb. You're not going to get any information at all from them. Uh, this is where we start to push the envelope a little bit. So the second phase is really around going gateless. So, so now we're at a stage where we've, we've got a single uh, meter operation. It's integrated with uh, mobile LPR. <clears throat> and the next phase is to look at how, how, do, how do we improve the access to the parkades because they're going to be our hubs. There was really three considerations for me. So we could spend a lot of money, as I've already mentioned, to maintain the status quo. Initially, I thought we could retain the gates and, and preserve that, um, pre preserve the revenue by associating a fixed LPR with the gates. The challenge there is that as good as the LPR is, you can't get a system that's 100%. So even at the read rates that we're seeing, and we're seeing read rates in the high 90s, um, you just that's just not good enough in a gated facility. It, it, it's 100% or nothing, in my opinion. So the, the solution, the, the, the notion that I had was, well, we already operate surface level lots fairly effectively. Why don't we just consider a parking garage a multi-level surface lot? And that's exactly the road that we went down. That's, that's how we, we got to the, the idea of gateless. So that's the sort of, that got us over the hump. But in terms of the change, there was a number of things that we did. We needed to model the financial impact if there was going to be any on, on revenue and compliance. So we played around with the numbers and we came up with a notion of, yep, there's bound to be, at least initially, some people who are going to chance their arm and park without paying. And we did see some of that, but it's actually not as bad as we, as, as we thought. <clears throat> um, so the finan financial impact, even if there was some bleed in terms of people not paying, we thought we'd actually get higher compliance and essentially that's exactly what we've seen. We, we worked very hard on communicating the changes widely, and I'll show you some more photographs in a second about how we did that. Signage in the, in the parking garages is really, really key because that's people are on autopilot until they get into your facility, and then they, then they figure out where they need to park, how do they pay. Location of and direction to meters was something that we heard about initially uh, up quite a lot. We don't hear about that anymore. Because if there's six exits, you would think there'd be six meters. Well, not so. You don't, it, it, why would we spend an awful lot of money buying a meter to put in a, a stairwell where that stairwell is very badly used? So we thought, okay, so, so we've, we've run the numbers, we've crunched it, let's go and pilot it in a garage uh, and then see what it, how does it work, what does it look like? <clears throat> and it became really apparent, like very, very quickly, literally within probably 10 days, that, that going gateless, um, is something that we can do. So with our current mobile LPR vehicles, we could enforce it to a pretty decent standard. We weren't seeing the financial um, bleed that, that we had some concerns around, and compliance was, generally speaking, very good. <clears throat> so what does it actually look like? So again, some more photographs. So this is our largest parkade. Um, so initially we had the, the, the hanging bars that say enter and do not enter. So to make it really obvious, we put very large um, uh, paint on the front of it to say this is exactly where you, where you enter and this is where you exit. And we've had no instance whatsoever because it, it's blindingly obvious. Inside, inside you can see that all we've done essentially is remove the gate. So we've left the islands in place to ensure that and um, cars don't try and set the land speed record as they as they enter the parkade. So just for just for vehicle movement control, speed control, we we left the islands in there. But other than that, everything's gone. The only thing we added were um, were some uh, speed bumps, and you'll notice that that they're that, that they're in two parts. Initially, we had them staggered because a speed bump 
uh, like this. As you go over it, your car just goes up and down. If you stagger them, you actually go side to side. It really slowed people down. It was super, super effective, but it caused a lot of complaints, more complaints about these speed bumps than any other changes that we've made at all. Inside the parkade, um, again, you've got to make sure that the signage is right. So again, the parkades are, the garages are liberally sprinkled with uh, the level, how you pay, um, how, what you need to do, what the instructions are, uh, directions to the, the meter, and very consistent with what you see in surface lots on the street. So again, we, at the exits, uh, we've got one or two uh, loop meters. Again, consistent signage. This one's got a bit more verbiage on it because our legal department like us to have lots of get out of jail free clauses. Uh, again, liberally sprinkled around the place. So the second phase of this uh, of this gateless piece was to look at uh, fixed LPR. The reason that we looked at at fixed LPR, removing the gates improved access. Fixed LPR improves control. So it helps protect your revenue, but it can go beyond that if you want to. So you could go down the road of nesting, so additional cameras inside the parkade, nest it. So an example, you could say uh, level one is only for, for visitors, level two is only for permit holders. And you can, you can manage that, I am sure, um, through LPR. Um, the fixed LPR is actually no different in many ways to the mobile LPR. It's exactly the same equipment. Uh, it's exactly the same software. And the way we've structured it, the only difference uh, it actually is that the way we structured the, the software around how long people get to, to pay before they hit our scofflaw list. So if a permit holder drives into the, into the parkade, they've already paid, no problem. If, 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 they have not, uh, if they're not a permit holder, they essentially get 15 minutes to uh, either pay, so add a meter or pay by phone, uh, or to exit. That Writing that bit of software, is, it was the critical piece for us, and Genetech, in fairness, did a very good job for us. What that gives us is a whole lot of information, and I'll show you some screenshots um, about the Genetech solution. Um, gives us a lot of information about real-time information, uh, occupancy infractions, who's coming, who's going. And we can use that to direct staff. So we've got six garages. If there's one vehicle in a garage that's uh, in violation that hasn't paid, but a different garage has got 10, we can now, instead of blindly sending a vehicle around there to catch that one, we can send that vehicle to the, the garage which has got the most violations and get them to deal with it. So it helps us with productivity, it helps us um, direct staff to where they need it. And the other bit about it is that it's invisible to the customer. Customers, by and large, are looking around, keeping an eye on where, where they're driving as opposed to what's that camera in the, the, the roof of the, the ceiling of the, the parkade. So the key message here really is, is that it's, it's, this is a software solution. The hardware, in my mind, is proven. It's tried and tested. These cameras are very, very solid. It's totally scalable, and you get a lot of data from it. So in many ways, in that, in that interconnected world that we all know we live in and is going to expand, being scalable and getting that data is absolutely crucial. So what does LPR look like? Well, this is the entrance to, we've currently got it in one parkade and we're just, we're just gonna deploy it in the other five. But this is how sexy and exciting it looks. So uh, again, so you can see the staggered configuration on the speed bumps, but the, the cameras are just exactly the same cameras that we've got mounted on the vehicles, except they're mounted on the, on, on the roof of the parkade as you drive in, and then on the exit, there's another, there's another set. It reads the, the, the rear, of the vehicle uh, as, as it drives in, because not all states or provinces require to have plates front and back. The data, so this, this is the Genito for free flow product. Uh, so this is a screenshot that we took the, the other day. So this is from the Fraser River Parkade, so the, the location where those cameras are. And you can see that it's got a capacity of 640, 147 vehicles 
in a, in a lot of this time. Occupancy is 23%, seven violations of 4.8%. It refreshes every 10 seconds. So it, it's super accurate. Even if you get a misread on the plate, the system will still say there's a vehicle in there. I, can't, I don't know what the plate number is, and I don't know if they're in violation, but it still contributes to the occupancy. So we're using this, and we like this a lot, which is, which is why we're very confident that when we deploy fixed LPR into the other parkades, we'll get similar results in terms of the ability to improve the access, customers love it, um, uh, but also to maintain control over the, both the revenue and, and the occupancy. This is another screenshot. Again, this is the kind of information you can pull from it. So these are vehicles that have entered, tells you exactly when they've come in, um, duration of the stay, so did they leave, did they, uh, um, what are they doing essentially within the parkade. So there's a lot of really, really good information from it much like any uh, software system is. So it's a, it's a good product, we like it. So you're probably all thinking there, well, what does this cost? Because this can't come cheap. So phase one, this is all in Canadian dollars. So essentially our loop meters and the mobile, mobile LPR cost about $800,000. Uh, phase two was 650, so I've rounded it up just to, because I know that there, there, there's some smaller cost in there, but our total capital cost for both, for, for all of this was about 1.6 million. So if we, if we say that we're to go down the road of reinstalling gates, re-equipping re, re and distri distributing uh, all those pucks to customers was in the three and a half, four million dollars, we've saved at least two million dollars of mitigated capital cost. That's good news. So we go with our number of 1.6 million. Um, that's what we've spent. Our operating cost reduction is about 400,000 a year. This is primarily because in the parkades, in the garages, we had staff manning um, uh, manning uh, the exits. So you take a ticket and you give it to the person at the end, and you pay. But we don't need those folks anymore. And that's the that's the probably the the most serious bit of the discussion here is that. I recognize that I've impacted a lot of people's lives. So this was about 22 mainly part-time uh, individuals. So we spent 1.6, we're saving uh, 400,000 a year, as a, that's a recurring savings. Uh, and we've seen our revenue go up. The revenue comes from better compliance. So what, what we've seen is that our permits year over year have jumped by about, the permit sales have jumped by about 16%. Uh, we're seeing more people pay at meters, and we've seen more people chancing their arm but getting caught. So it's, it rolls up to about a million dollars. So the ROI for phase one and phase two, I would say, is in the 12 to 14, could be less than that. If you did, if you just went down the road uh, and, and implemented phase one, so single meter type uh, and mobile LPR, I bet you it's in the eight months range. And then for, for, for the fixed LPR, add another few months on top of it. So it pays for itself. This, this is, from a financial perspective, this, this will save you a ton of money in my mind, certainly our experience. Now there's other ways to make money, but I'm guessing that you don't want to be chancing your arm at poker uh, and putting that, the, 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 the keys to the house on the line. Um, so I choose not to do this. Customer impact. So this is this is something that I knew that I knew we were going to save people time, but I didn't realize how much. So 20 seconds, 20, 30 seconds each way, call it 40 seconds per day. We park about 5,000 cars a day. So it adds up to, you can see the math and hopefully it's right, about 12,375 hours per year based on 45 weeks. It's almost certainly an understatement, an underestimate. So we save people a lot of time, and this is actually a, uh, a customer comment that I received not too long ago. It must have taken significant time and effort to roll out. Thank you for making my day easier and more efficient. And I've actually got a thank you card sitting on my, uh, on my window signed by a faculty department. I don't know that I've ever had a thank you card for some of the work that I've done, not in a long time anyway. Um, 
In terms of sustainability, some fun facts about idling. Idling for 15 minutes uses about a liter of gas, and a liter of gas produces about 2.3 kilos of CO2. So that waiting of 12,300 hours uses about 45, 49,500 liters of gas, or about 13,000 US gallons. So that means, in an, on an annual basis, and I'm betting this is an under, underestimated, that we've saved about 114,000 kilos of greenhouse gas, or about a quarter of a million pounds per year. That's a pretty substantial saving, and you've got to put a lot of EVs on the road to find that kind of, of sustainability. I hadn't factored that in when I did this, when I started looking at this project, but that's actually garnered quite a lot of, uh, of interest. The alternative, of course, is to go and spend an awful lot of money on carbon offsets, and I'm guessing that nobody wants to do that. So that, that's, that's where we're currently at. Where we're going next, so I'm expecting lots of disruption. So this is actually in order of, of where UBC is heading, so sensor technology. So we've already got single space sensors, and we're looking at multi-space uh, monitoring. Intelligent signage. What I mean by that is that I bet you everybody on this call has got some parking, probably um, ADA or uh, handicap wheelchair accessible parking that sits empty for an awful long time. If you put sensors in there, why can't you have sensors connected to digital signage that changes who can park there? So one minute, one minute it could be 15 minutes pick up and drop off, and the next minute when somebody parks on one of these sensors, the sign or an available space. Uh, the sign changes to show it as uh, disabled or handicap access only. That so that has got a lot of a, a lot of us thinking, and we're working on deploying some a solution for that. Dynamic pricing. It it always struck me as interesting that you would never sell a condo building and, and charge the same for an apartment at the penthouse or at the ground level. So why do we do that in parking? Well, now we've got the ability to to do that by looking at. Um, using the fixed LPR to permit and then monitor occupation or occupancy levels. Um, and I think there's some good money in that. The, last, the next bit there is in, in garage tolling. So as an example, so if you've got an account with us and you've already registered, why can't you just drive in, park, don't even bother, go to a meter, and then when you drive out, you just get charged the appropriate amount. Uh, mobile payments, mobile platforms. So mobile wallet, geocaching, and, and direction. So once you've got all this data, you can push it to an app. It says, there's spaces here, this parkade's full. Um, or here's the rate that, that may or may not change. You've got a lot of data, so you can mine it to personalize the customer experience. Now this is where we start to get into a little bit more uh, longer term. Uh, Multimodal solutions. So how do you get people transferring from a car to a bike to walking? Um, Alternative uh, energies, so EV expansion. Uh, we're, we are looking at uh, using solar for to, to put in place a hydrogen fuel cell refueling plant as well. Um, and then last but not least, and this is probably more more we're more for on the manufacturers, connected vehicles. So once you've got all this information, how do you connect with the customer, or more importantly, with their vehicle? Uh, to ensure that they're going to the right place at the right time, improve their experience, reduce wait times, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we're getting to the end. So my summary, so here's my perspective. I actually think we're facing the same challenges. Uh, I, I would recommend that you define the finish line before you start. That's where the hard work is. It's not in putting a camera on the, the roof of a parking garage. That's easy. It's figuring out how you, how you do it, and do you really want to do it? Uh, the current hardware is it works, uh, and the software will scale and adapt. It's still relatively early for some of this stuff. It's very good, but by the time we get to version 4.0, it'll be absolutely stellar. I don't think you need gates, and I've thought about this a lot. There'll be people who try and tell me that in my environment, I need gates. I don't know that you do. And, and why don't you pilot it? Why don't you try it? Um, and then the last thing is, whilst you might not need gates, I do think you need intelligent systems and integration. That's, that's where the future lies, I think, is in terms of 
having these systems, having smart parking and, and having it fully integrated internally and externally as well. Uh, here's my details. Um, feel free to call or email me. Uh, yep, that's all right. I'm just double checking. And uh, other than that, that's really all I've got to say. And I'll shut up for a little bit and hopefully you've got some questions and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Okay, Brad, first question. Um, has utilizing LPR increased ticket revenue? Uh, if so, by what percentage? Good question. Let me just get my financial pack. Two seconds and I will tell you. Uh, traffic fine revenue, yes. So year over year, uh, so last month we were up 16%. Um, year over year, we're up probably in the 3 to 5% range. Uh, another question here, Brad. What does the revenue increase of one million relate to as a percentage of overall revenue? Um, so our, our total revenue uh, it, it, in 2015, our revenue was about 12 million. So we've gone from 12 to 13. Um, and in the two years that I've been here, we've 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 essentially because we were fit, well, I've been here three years. The first year was just figuring parking out. Um, Moving to that single uh, meter platform and getting our, our existing LPR fully functioning, not just looking at scoff floor, that helped us move from about 11 and a half so uh, to 12. So in, in I'd say in, in 18 months we've added about a million and a half. Um, figure out the percentage. What's that? 10 10 percent. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, do your departments ever set up prepaid parking for events? Uh, and if so, how do you handle it now with this new solution? Um, prepaid parking for events, we haven't got there yet. That, that is definitely something that we want to do. Uh, the reason we haven't got there yet is that we're waiting to get on to uh, the, the latest version of Flex so that we can start to use uh, the event, the, um, uh, well, I'm not sure what it's called, the event module. Um, so at, at the moment, um, at the moment, people will pay at at the meter. What we've done with with large events, though, so again, these these meters can be moved. So so what we do is we actually move meters. So if we've got a big event and we know we're going to need 15 meters, we just literally put 15 meters there and move them from different locations. It's it's very very easy to do. The the, the concept that we that we've dabbled with is actually having some meters on a, on a small, low-level trailer that we would literally wheel up and park it at the front of, of the entrance to the concert hall or wherever it is, and have people park there, uh, pay there, sorry. Um, another question, uh, asking you if you could sort of dive in a little more about how the option that your parkers had to move from between garage to garage. Uh, well, they don't because um, uh, that, that's certainly an option that, that we that we, you can enable if you choose to do so. Um, by, by and large, if, if you pay at a meter, you've parked it. You've, you've paid to park a specific location. If you choose to, to move somewhere else, uh, technically you're going to be on the on the you'll be on the list of uh, in violation because you've moved from eight, from location one to location five. The software, I believe, w w can can change that if you want to do it that way. So you could have a code or a payment that says, yep, you can park anywhere you like. Um, another question here, what is the minimum distance required from the fixed cameras to the vehicle at the entrance of the Nexus? I don't know the technical on that one. I would think it's actually the minimum distance is going to be really, really um, not a lot. I, I think it'll be quite short. We, what, there's an interesting background to this. So a couple of years ago, I was, I was uh, into traffic um, because I wanted to find a, a, a sensor and a, and a camera solution. So initially, um, I was told that fixed LPR wouldn't work. And I don't know about, about you, but I, I don't like to hear no. So, um, so we started working with a, a different company who actually gave us, uh, we piloted and, and their, their camera and just just put it in the in the ground essentially on, on some of the equipment. 
And that can't have been more than three or four feet away. It was very close. And I, so I suspect that the cameras themselves, uh, because they can be tuned, you can have them at, at a fairly good distance or very close up if you want to. Um, a couple other LPR questions here. How is the accuracy for those fixed LPR cameras out of the box, and what tweaks, if any, did you make to improve upon them? Um, well, they're using they're using the same software that that uh, that are, uh, that's currently running on our mobile LPR. So accuracy. So the the issue with accuracy, I think, is it, it's definitely not about the hardware. The software, sure. So I I, I bet you that we get about ninety six percent. So it's very very high. But the reason we get such high uh, high hit rate is because BC has got a very it, it, it's got a pretty consistent license plate uh, configuration. Now, I know that's not necessarily true in, in a lot of the states where you can basically print your own license plate at home and, and away to go. But that's where I think that the software will adapt. It, it, you know, you can have, if you've got 60 different license plates out there, all you've got to do is essentially get that software to, to recognize and read 60 plates. And when somebody brings on a 61st, you just add that to the list. Another LPR question, can the fixed LPR output um, send its live data to occupancy signage? It totally can, and that's exactly where we're going with it. So, so uh, occupancy at UDC is lumpy. So we've got six, six parkades. Three of them are pretty full all the time, and three of them are probably about 50, 50 60 percent. Um, and that's exactly what we want to do. So now that we've got these platforms in place and we've got this data, we can turn that into usable information. So we can push that to signage uh, on, a, on a mobile app. We can push it to signage on the website. We can send it to a sign that's at the entrance, and that's exactly what we intend to do with it. Um, one thing I want to mention, I've got a lot of questions about uh, the recording of this webinar. Yes, there will be a recording made available to all attendees. Um, Another question here. Um, for the communication and networking, um, is it done, is it all hardwired or is it LTE? So say that again, I missed that a little bit, sorry. The communication for the, um, the devices, is it hardwired or is it LTE communication? Uh, so mobile is obviously uh, LTE. We do have very good Wi-Fi coverage on campus as well. Um, it's quite surprising, actually. We've only found a couple of black spots uh, within the within the garages where we've had to put in a a, a a cell booster, but they're not particularly expensive. So, so our coverage has actually been very good. I've been actually really quite surprised. Another question here: um, What do you do about an unexpected flood of visitors uh, when you want to hold for your permit parkers? Yeah, so uh, so this is, this is where it gets interesting, right? Um, there's no the, the the way that the way I think the, that we would do it today would be if if we had to essentially reserve locations, we'd have to physically go out there and cordon them off, or put some kind of signage in there. And so yeah, so that that's a, that's a little bit lumpy. I wouldn't say that we've got that solution nailed down just yet. Um, another question, um, as part of the capital savings that you made on this project, were you able to reduce the number of staff uh, that you're using now? Yeah, that's exactly what we did. So that's part of that 400,000 savings. So, so we, we, we reduced we reduced the, the, the head count for the attendance in the, in the, the garages. We, we increased very slightly the number of enforcement folks because we had UBC operates paid parking 24-7, including the weekends. So we're very unforgiving. Our staff coverage in the evenings and weekends was poor. And we knew we had, uh, particularly with some athletics users, fairly bad compliance, particularly on Saturdays in the summer. So, so, we, we used, so that's a net saving. It was actually, I think the overall, the, the total reduction was probably in the five, 550 range. Um, we, we invested some of that to make sure we had better coverage 
to ensure better compliance. Um, have you had any issues with cars pulling in uh, too close to each other uh, and therefore the vehicle, uh, the, the camera not reading the vehicle behind its uh, license plate? No, we, we, we haven't had that actually. Uh, um, we, we don't get a lot of um, vehicles where either they're too close or their plate is obscured. I mean, we do get some. Uh, it's, it's an inevitability. But, but don't forget, we're still sending mobile LPR through the parkades. We're just doing it as and when needed. So when the guys are, are going around and they come across a plate that they didn't read, they'll just stop and check it. They'll, they'll tap it into their, their handheld. So if the plate is, if it's a temporary, uh, if it's a temporary plate, so it's printed on a sheet of paper and it's in your, your rear window, um, it may not be read. But they'll come across it. They'll, they'll, they'll see it as they go through the parkades. One other question here. Um, as part of the system, do you feel that uh, citation revenue will increase or plateau at some point? Um, I think it'll probably plateau. I, I don't know that. I, I, I don't know that it'll continue to increase. Um, but what I think will increase is compliance, and I, and I think that's actually that's the better story in my mind. You know, I, I, as much as this, this might pain some people, I, my, my take is is that if I would much prefer compliance over, over issuing fines. Um, it, 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 it makes life fair and equitable for everybody who's parking. But then there's no arguments. You, you, we, you know, the, the biggest issue that I suspect most people in parking see is that you charge a lot of money, um, and then, you know, I was only there for two minutes, yet you gave me a ticket. Well. If, if you're not, if people are compliant, you're not giving anybody a ticket. It, it sounds a bit, you know, you know, might be, you know, left coast tree hugger kind of thought process, but, um, but, but that's very much where I'd prefer to be. I'd much prefer to be, you know, high compliance and, and low level of fines. Another question: Have you had any issues with vandalization of your cameras or any other of the new equipment? No, not at all. The the only the only issues that we've had is it, you know we're a university, right? So and I'm guessing you'll see this in cities as well. Is, is people putting the occasional flyer on the side of one of the loop meters? But other than that, we've had nothing. We've had no vandals, uh, uh, no issues in terms of uh, security uh, and around the meters or the equipment. So so yeah, it's it, it I've had no issues like that at all. All right, Brian, I think that does it uh, for our questions. Thank you again for everyone joining us today. And like I said, we will be sending out a recording to this uh, early next week. Uh, thank you again for joining us, joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Michael. Everybody dropped off.